You know why I like preaching at my church? Because y'all know how to act. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you something. If nobody else thought that, me and Willis did. I know That's it's right. Come on. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. As an evangelist, we traveled all over the country and really the world, and not everybody knows how to worship. They really don't. And it is it is a shame. And I was telling Brandon the challenges that, that, that he may face is one of the things is when we came here, people didn't worship like this. And we had to train them. This is the norm. This is what it's supposed to be like for you to worship God freely and to feel the freedom to do that the way that you want to. And we don't too much care now. If you're standing on your head, you better know it's God because I might come <laughs> do something then. But, but we want you to feel the freedom to worship. Come on. In the house because it's, it's a good thing to worship God. Come on, somebody. I was blessed this week to go be in uh, my son-in-law, Geo, had John Arnott. Does anybody know who John Arnott is? I was in the presence of John Arnott this week and got to spend some time with him in a very uh, remote and private setting. Brandon and I both went, and it was really cool. And if you don't know, but you do know about the Toronto Blessing, anybody know about the Toronto Blessing? He's the guy that pastored that thing for 30 years. And um, I was blessed to be in his presence this week, so I fully expect God to do something today. He did pray for me. He and his wife prayed for me. And Brandon wrote me and said that their names are John and Carl, uh, Carol Arnett. And he said, or not, rather. And, and he said, um, I thought we were going to see John and Carol, but they are not. <laughs> <laughs> He's dead yet. If you didn't get that, we'll write it out for you later. <laughs> But I've had something on my mind because I feel like God sometimes will go fishing for one person. No. Sometimes when you're in a congregation, the message is for everybody. But sometimes God will go fishing for one particular person for whatever reason. And I don't know which this is, to be honest with you. It might be for a bunch of you, and it might be for one. Now, that being said, you may not feel like it's for you today, but you don't know what Tuesday will bring. Because life happens. Hmm. I have a, a question that I want to open with, if you'll put that up for me. Thank you. Have you felt like giving up lately? And you may not feel that way today. Because you may not have been through much lately. But there are people in this congregation who are walking through, everybody say through, things that are incredibly difficult right now my wife and I are two of them for 15 years we had a little puppy dog her name's Lilo and she got sick and it manifested literally overnight and it was a very sad occasion this past week when we had to take her to the vet and the vet said, I think the kindest thing you can do is to euthanize her. I'm going to tell you, I don't know about you. Uh, I read something about horses in heaven. Anybody else read that? <laughs> and so I, somebody asked me, said, Pastor, and actually it was my, my, one of my grandchildren, said, Pop, Pop. I said, do you think that our pets will make it into heaven? I said, well, there's there's horses there. So so I kind of feel like that, see, see, God did not create something for you to enjoy just here 
and say that heaven's going to be better there than it is here and leave out what you enjoyed here, there. But sometimes things are difficult and things hit you unexpectedly. And, some t and usually, as Morton Salt knew, when it rains, it pours. And there are things that happen that sometimes it just takes. The reason we do that one song, it may be midnight, it may be day. He's never early, he's never late. I don't know if you ever listened to the words in the second verse of that song. When it says, some face a lifetime of falling tears. There's some things you just don't get over that easy. And you try. And you put. And I'm talking to Christians now. I'm not talking about people that are out in the world. Of course, they go through things. But even, I want us to be like Israel. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, Where would I be? You only know. But I'm glad you see through eyes of love a hopeless case. <laughs> if not for grace. Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and my heart fail. Everybody say these next two words. But God. I fail all the time, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I can't imagine really what it's like for somebody to go through life without the Lord in their life. I don't want to either. I have the Lord to lean on. When times are good, he's with me. When times are bad, the Bible said he is a very present help in a time of trouble. And Jesus went on to tell us that in this world you will have tribulation. You're going to have problems. You're going to lose a spouse. Some of you people have been through some of that. You're going to lose somebody dear to you. You're going to lose a child. And in those moments, you might say, well, where was God when my child or my spouse died? He was in the same place he was when his child died. On the throne, knowing what is best, even though it hurt. Do you realize that when, when the angel of the Lord was talking to Mary and said, you're going to have this child and it's going to be blessed and you're going to call him Jesus, but it's going to pierce your soul. When you sit there at the cross, we cannot even begin to fathom what it had to be like for Mary. I'm blessed and highly favored. Everybody say that. I'm blessed and highly. Yeah, well, so was she. And she had to watch her son of promise die. I, I, I tend to warn people when you start saying, I'm blessed and highly favored. You don't really know sometimes what you're, because some of the disciples would say to Jesus, you know, we want to be number one and number two in the kingdom. And he said, can you drink from the cup? Can you face what I'm about to face? Let me say this, though. Christians struggle. We all do. You're human, and we have the human condition, and we struggle. And let me say this. You are not alone when you struggle. If people are honest, people everywhere could raise their hand and say, I've struggled at one point in time or another, or I am right now. This is true, and it's not fun. Somewhere along the line, we got the idea that if we become Christians, we have it smooth and easy from then on. That is not what the Bible says. We make it sound like if we get saved and give a little money in an offering, we're going to get a you know, million dollars sent to us. Live happily ever after. Well, happily ever after was a story 
book. The storybook is happily ever after, but it's not necessarily happily in the here and now. <laughs> uh, you're not alone, and you're not in bad company. Because when you consider, uh, I don't know, some of the Bible guys, you ever look at the Bible and actually read it? Do I have glasses up here? Yeah. Are they? Nope. Somewhere. I got glasses. Y'all pray for them to manifest in Jesus' <laughs> name. <laughs> I don't know what I did. See? There they go. Praise the Lord for a good wife. Amen. Consider Job. Now, now, look. Job was the guy that Satan was in heaven talking to Jesus and talking to God, and he said, have you considered my servant Job? How many want to be recognized by God <laughs> like that? <laughs> go, go down there and check him out, and you can do anything you want to him except for take his life. So he lost all his children, lost all his cattle, lost his home, and he kept the one thing he didn't need, and that was a mouthy wife. <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> she walked in there and said, why don't you cuss your God and die? He also had a couple other things. He had three bad friends. <laughs> Listen to what Job said in Job 7, 15. Is it in there? Okay, don't worry about it. Trust me, if you don't, by now, get rid of me so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my body. No. Job was saying, I'd rather die than go on living. You can hurt so bad. Feel so abandoned. You're not, but you feel that way. And perception is, come on, say it if you know it, perception is is our reality. Whether it is actually real or not, it's what we perceive it to be. And so when you feel like things are not going well, have you ever felt that way where you felt like walking out on your family? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> I did it years ago. Have you ever felt like walking out on your church? And never coming back. Quitting your job. Getting in the car and taking what money you have, put it in gas and go as far as it goes and just hiding. <laughs> I know, I'm the only one. <laughs> the Bible called Job a perfect man, but yet and all he was saying, dude, I'd rather die than deal with this. But he went through it. And restoration came. I want you to know something. He got blessed with more children. Now I want you to hear this because this is often missed. It doesn't mean they replaced the ones that were gone and he never missed them again. I'm sure my aunt Marguerite was our children's church teacher and director or whatever you call her when we were growing up. And she taught us a lot of things. And she was a good woman, a godly woman. My family can verify that. Uncle Grover was in the hospital in Tallahassee, and I went in and I was sitting next to her when Uncle Grover was very elderly, and so was she. And she looked at me with tears in her eyes, and she said this to me, because she had a son who at age 23 got killed on the way home from work by a train on, right off of Highway 90, a train crossing, hit him, and killed him like that. And she looked at me 40 years later, roughly, might have been 30, looked at me way later and said, I've never gotten over it. You would be less than human if you do. 
she had more children and she had gobs and gobs of grandchildren but no one ever replaced Dale my cousin that was killed and so when Job was restored that sounds great doesn't it but it wasn't the same and there are things that you will walk through that you will never be the same again God's fishing for somebody Elijah let me tell you about Elijah he raised someone from the dead Elijah prayed and shut the heavens this is a powerful man of God he called down fire from heaven he killed 450 prophets of Baal and yet when Jezebel threatened him he ran and sat under a juniper tree and said these words I'm the only one had a minister call this week and they said I'm being challenged in this area and I'm going into this new area and I'm thinking where are the churches she the person said I am the only one and I thought you have the same syndrome Elijah had when we're going through things it does feel sometimes like we're the only one It's going to get better, y'all. 1 Kings 19.10 says, I am the only one left. That was, whew, dude, talking about feeling lonely and despondent and all broke down, scared to death. He just killed 450 men. He's scared of a queen. Hmm. Jeremiah, you ever heard of him? <laughs> Known as the what? The weeping prophet because everything that he did felt like, he did what God told him to, and none of it came to pass in his lifetime. Isn't that great? Hey, prophets, don't y'all want that? <laughs> yeah, because in, in the Old Testament, we just kill you. Get it over with. Jeremiah 15, 10 says, This is terrible for me. I am sorry. I am sorry, mother, that you gave birth to me. I cause trouble and arguments wherever I go in the land. I never lend money to people, and I do not ask them to lend money to me, but everyone curses me anyhow. <laughs> That's Old Testament stuff. It don't count unless it's in the New Testament, right? Well, <laughs> Peter, this guy, went through some stuff. Peter said, where are you going that I can't go? to Jesus I'll go with you anywhere even unto death until it comes up and Jesus just looks at him and says today you're going to deny me three times and three separate occasions on that day now you go read your Bible read the Gospels if you don't do nothing else read those four and, and read the, the last three chapters in each one of them and it'll cover kind of the trial and everything that goes on you'll get some of this but just, just read the last three chapters because that's the crucifixion, the resurrection and stuff. That's good stuff. And it's during that time frame that, that Peter says, it's, I'm good. I'll die for you. And Jesus said, ain't going to happen. You're going to deny me three times. And one of the gospels say this. When he denied him the third time, the, the rooster crowed. And when he did, it said Jesus just looked at him. But he didn't leave him like that. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And, 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 and you had to see the reason he was doing that was because he was scared for his own life at that point. And he was discouraged. But I want to see the ultimate example. Everybody want to see the ultimate example? Then we got to go to a place called Gethsemane. Jesus finished up eating with his crew. And the Bible said they sang a hymn and they went out. And they went into this garden. And Jesus began to pray. Now Jesus had a little bit of an inside circle, if you will. And he said, let's go, boys. We're going to go up here and pray. We're going to bring the rest of them, but us four, we're going up here and pray. And the Bible said that Jesus began to pray. And he knew what was coming, guys. He knew exactly he is 100% man, 
100% God. He knew exactly what was coming, and he was stressed out. You know how I know? Because your Bible records these words, that his sweat became as dr great drops of blood. The way that that happens is you get under stress so much that your blood pressure raises so much that the capillaries in the skin rupture and blood comes out instead of sweat. And then it pours through the skin. This is a lot of pressure. I'm not a medical doctor, but I know something about it. And he's like, there you go, Luke 22, 44, being in agony. He prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's stressed out. But he gives us an example. <laughs> and he says, not my will, but that thy will be done. 1 Peter 4.12 says this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, and though some strange thing has happened to you, alone I got some things I want to tell you today when you're going through that you need to realize God has a better plan than you do try it over here when you're going through something you need to understand that God has a better plan than you do he knows right where you're at and right where you're going and he wants to take you to places really, that you've never been. He's going to bring you through stuff that you can't survive on your own. And when he does, it'll be him who gets the glory because you're not strong enough. But here's what I understand. In my weakness, his strength is made perfect. So when I'm going through stuff, when I feel like facing the wall and turning away from my wife and everybody else and crying intensely, I talk to the women because you men are too manly to admit that you would ever feel that way. Now I'll talk to the men. Because we know you do, and we know that you think you have a plan, and when the plan is not working, you don't know what to do. And then you think, everybody's going to know I've been faking it as a man especially if you've had some success in the past, but now you're struggling again. Whew. Especially at some point in time, if you were recognized for your accomplishments, maybe you were in the military and you, you got some accomplishments and they gave you some accolades, and, and now you're just a civilian again. I, 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 I like the, the Rambo movies, just to be honest with you. So when I was in the service... This is John Rambo at the end. When I was in the service, I could fly a gunship. I, I, could, I, I could use a tank. I was in charge of million-dollar equipment. Here, I can't even get a job washing cars. Jalen, let me address you, and I don't mean to call you out by any means, but the problem with being successful as an athlete during high school and college and that is once you get out, what do I do? And if you didn't make it to Major League Baseball, what's next? And you wish that you could go back to what we call the glory days. But you're struggling because you don't want anybody to know that how bad you're struggling. I've always had it together. I've always looked good. I was always cool. I was always good. Everybody, everybody liked me because of what I did. And you've got your identity from that, and you can't do that. You've got to get your identity from Christ. Amen. Because only he can satisfy you all the days of your life. Amen. I know some people came in here struggling. We used to sing a song. I must tell Jesus all of my struggles. I cannot bear these burdens alone. 
I need him on the job 24-7. The Bible says pray without ceasing. I don't know how you do anything but pray. I ride down the road. I'm praying. I'm flying our little airplane. I'm praying. I'm not kidding you. you y'all, y'all think it's not a joke. Lord, help me to do things right. Help me to learn the lessons that I need to do. I need to get back to my family. I promised my wife to bring her husband home safely. And I'm praying. God, I don't know what else to do. I'm praying. Everybody in here right now should be praying about your economics. I'm not, I, I'm not putting anybody down. I'm not putting anybody's business out. Maybe you got it like that, and you think you got it like that, but have you seen the pictures of Germany after the war where they had wheelbarrow loads of money sitting there, and it was worth nothing? America is headed that direction. Y'all want an economic lesson? Just real quick. This is why you need to know this. In about 2000, the year 2000, gasoline was 93 cents a gallon. That means I could buy, with a million dollars, that means I could buy a million million gallons worth of gasoline. Yesterday, it was like $3.60. That means I can get a little over 300,000 of the same gasoline with a million dollars. What does that tell you? It means your money's going downhill. It doesn't mean that gas has gotten more valuable. A gallon of gas is a gallon of gas is a gallon of gas. So when they when they start telling you your house is now worth four hundred thousand dollars and you bought it five years ago for two hundred thousand, it doesn't tell you that you're 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 actually inflated in in and you you gained in your house. It's really telling you this story. A bag of potato chips is almost six bucks. The same stuff that when we were in school, you could get for about 85 cents. So I'm telling you, you need to be in prayer. Because (laughs) things are coming. But my flesh and my heart fail, but God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, As therefore we shall be surrounded by a great cloud of lightning, so let us say, lay aside every weight and sin which does easily ensnare us, and let us run with endurance. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Our only hope. That's our only hope. I'll try this side. That's our only hope. It sure ain't in the politicians. Come on, somebody. It sure, it's the strangest time of my lifetime. Anybody ever heard of John Rich, country music guy? He was sitting in his house not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, and he said, I started hearing a melody, and I started hearing the sound of a song in my head and words and stuff. And, and he started writing out this thing. He said, Revelation, Revelation, coming like a freight train. He said, Jesus is coming. These things are about, our hope is not in what happens and who gets elected in November. I hope that's not your hope. Now, here's what I also want to say to you. God took the time to set you up today and to tell you in this little message that I'm giving you, he knows right exactly where you're at. He knows the struggles that you're in and that. But Jesus said, I will go back to the Father, but I will not leave you comfortless. And so he sent the Holy Spirit to us. And I want to tell you something. I believe is going to happen today. There's some things that I am convinced of, partly because I'm married to this woman here and I've seen it work for years. God is wanting to touch you today. Amen. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to open the altar in just a f- couple of minutes, probably be a couple. And I'm going to pray for you today. And when I do, 
you're going to receive. Now stop a minute and let me talk. I'm going to lay hands on you and I'm going to pray. I don't need you to pray. I'm going to pray. I need you to agree. Because the Bible says where two or three agree as touching, it's going to happen. And I believe, this is the next thing, I don't need you to analyze. If God knocks you down, I'm happy. If God don't knock you down, I'm happy. I don't care. That stuff does not impress me at all. But I'm going to tell you something. If you won't analyze and you won't reason, you know what happens sometimes? You, you pray for somebody, they fall out, and then they go, Lord, what am I doing down here? Do I deserve to be down here? Oh, they're looking at me. All this, all this stuff going on in your head. Instead of receiving, you got all this junk going on, and you're trying to figure out, well, am I worthy to get touched? Am I not worthy? Did, did I, uh, Lord, you know, I, I, I did a lot of good this week, but I did two or three bad things, so that cancels all the good. We got stupid stuff that goes on. And all the king wants to do is touch you. And he's going to. And you don't have to analyze it. You know why sometimes we don't get healed? Well, I don't feel any different. Let me think about it. My knee's still in pain? Yeah, no, my knee still hurts. Uh, I didn't think it was going to work anyway. That's your problem. You've been thinking. Stop it. Stop it. We're going to pray for you because Luke chapter 24, verse 8. Put that up if you got it. I don't. I think it's verse eight. She does such a good job. Look at this. Here it comes right now. <laughs> well, you do it because I don't need him to learn while we're in the middle of service. Please. <laughs> Look at that. And they remembered his word. I read that this morning. And it went all over me. You need to quit thinking. And start remembering. Amen. Did he say he'd heal us? Yes. Psalm 107 20. He sent his word and. Did he say he'd set us free? Amen. Did he say he'd forgive us? Yes. Did he say he'd wash our sins away? Yes. Why, are we why are we remembering everything but his word? So I don't know what you're going through. And I felt like God said, I'm going to fish for some people today. I don't talk that way. Maybe it's because I went fishing this week. I don't know. <laughs> but he said, I'm going after specific people today. And he wants to touch you. By faith, I can tell you, the Holy Spirit's here. And he's going to visit some of you in a way that you needed him to, but you've been resistant to because of your own stinking thinking. I need something. Or I ain't going to quit. I know you've been going through it. I know some of us. Our flesh fails. Our minds fail, but God. I know people have felt like running. How do you know, Brother Ken? I felt like running myself. Somebody help.